the EduHop website. So welcome everybody to this webinar about TinCan API presented by Christian Glan. I'm going shortly to introduce Christian before we start with the webinar. And also I'm going to say one or two things about uh, the questions. If you have any questions to the presenter during his presentation, you can write it in the chat. And I will monitor the chat and transmit the questions to the presenter. Or you can also use the raise hand symbol in the top menu. You see a little man raising his hand. You can click on this and then I can give you the microphone and you can ask your question directly to Christian Glan. Okay, now I'm going to introduce Christian. Christian Glan works at the Center for Security Studies of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, ETH. He is instructional designer for the International Relations and Security Network, ISN. The ISN in Zurich offers e-learning services for training and further education at military academies in Europe. And the aim of the ISN is to support, test and develop new learning technologies for military academies in Europe and to help institutions to implement new learning technologies. The ETH Zurich, where the ISN is based, has a research contract with the US-based Colabs, who support the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative. Christian Glan and his team receive funding from the Colabs to conduct research for this initiative. So Christian, the word is yours. Uh, thank you for being here today and for telling us more about your work. Thank you very much, Natalie, uh, and welcome everybody to this webinar, which is titled Tin Can in the Wild. And the title is because I will talk about the experiences that we made in one of our projects uh, where we implemented Tin Can and uh, looked into the practical issues of this very new specification. So when I talk about Tin Can, or I mention it only in the title actually, um, you have to know that TinCan is the code name for the Experience API uh, before it was actually called Experience API or XAPI as you can find it uh, frequently on the net. And uh, it was called TinCan before the ADL initiative publicly released the Experience API in January this year. Um, as you know, the ADL initiative has also brought us SCORM with all the troubles and uh, niceties that uh, this nice specification uh, brought to the world of e-learning and technology-enhanced learning. The big question behind all these in initiatives of the ADL initiative and the ADL Collabs as their operative arm is how can we improve the interoperability between tools, services, and systems? And as you know, the previous specification primarily focused on the interoperability of learning resources. But now we're going to shift more into towards uh, live tools, services, and systems that need to interoperate during runtime. So why you run a course? The not so big questions behind this very big one uh, that directly affect the Experience API is how to build um, with various tools and services complex and yet attractive learning environments and how to create more exciting learning experiences. So this is really uh, the keywords that we need to focus at. Complexity, attractiveness and being more exciting for the learners. A few words of warning before we dwell into these questions I try to answer. The first thing is I will talk about prototypes and data structures. So there will be not so much of a demonstration of tools and how they interoperate because uh, actually you won't really see much if you look at the Experience API in, in this sense. So I talk about the concepts and how we implemented them. So therefore, you need a very basic understanding 
of virtual learning environments and how they work, modern web applications such as web mashups, uh, interoperability standards in a very broad sense, uh, interactive systems and sensor networks. And indeed, I will talk about prototypes and data structures. So when I talk about integrating it with virtual learning environments, then you need to be always aware that this will not work with your virtual learning environment or LMS at home. But if you ask nicely, I may help you uh, in a project there. So a, a few words about me. I'm a researcher and instructional designer in a way at the ISN Zurich, which is part of the ETHZ. And I'm also member of the executive board of the International Association for Mobile Learning, as well as chairing the Swiss-based EduHub uh, Special Interest Group for Mobile Learning. So my main um, focus of work is in the mobile realm. So most of the work that I do and the example that I present here are related to mobile learning indeed. Uh, personally, I'm a thinker and doer of educational solutions, so I'm not only thinking about new concepts and new ideas, but I also try to implement them. And I do that for several years, and I'm um, fairly successful with that. Uh, at the same time, I try to share knowledge and technologies as open source, as open access information, and try to discuss as much as possible, and try to also educate younger people students uh, to make use of these ideas and technologies in practice. And finally, I make complex technology jump through hoops. So in the past, I hooked uh, mobile applications into legacy learning management systems. I socialized web environments that were previously static read-only environments. I invented the co-invented the micro-learning approach, uh, connected mobile and ambient computing with web-based training, and created impossible adaptive courses with IMS learning design. Uh, impossible, that means uh, until that time, everybody thought that that won't be possible. So what is my business with the Experience API? So as Natalie said, the ISN Zurich collaborates with the ADL Colabs, who are the operative arm of the ADL initiative. So the ADL Colabs are the ones who do the things, whereas the um, ADL initiative are the ones who coordinate. And our research at the ISN is basically focusing on new delivery channels, and that means practically mobile learning. We intend to promote within this uh, complex environment the interoperability specifications within um, European security and defense organizations. This is basically the higher education um, organizations within the militaries of your national countries most, of, <clears throat> most likely. And we provide open source tools and open access services that support these new interoperability specifications that are issued by the ADL Collabs. So this is uh, how I came and became involved with the Experience API, and I'm looking at how we can make a better use and more exciting use of this uh, specification, which is a big chunk of paper um, in practical terms, so normal people can actually make use of it and benefit from the ideas and concepts that have been introduced. So the first question I like to answer is how to create more exciting learning experiences. So the first thing I need to explicify here is when I talk about learning experiences, I talk about any performance that contributes to personal learning. And as you know, uh, performance is in e-learning often recognized as assessment or reading material or doing assignments that are um, uh, given to learners by a teacher or by instructional design in a more abstract term. But they can also involve other people. They can happen basically everywhere. They can happen uh, in the supermarket. They can happen in school. They can happen uh, on the bus, wherever you are, basically. And they can include various technologies and media. 
So in the past, web-based training and a lot of interoperability standards for web-based training were focused on the desktop computer. But as you know, we have a lot of technologies around us that are increasingly interconnected and uh, that starts with mobile phone and ends somewhere uh, near your TV screen. Um, learning experiences in this context need to be uh, measurable and quantifiable in order to be used uh, as a control mechanism in a learning process. And these learning experiences, when I talk about this term, contribute to evidence of learning. So this always means when I say learning experiences, this is something that we can measure, that we can say this happened so many times, and this actually proves that a learner did indeed learn something. So the question that many people ask at the first, first um, encounter with the XAPI is what is the actual problem that this new specification intends to solve? Because we have a lot of specification already at hand and it doesn't really seem new. And so the problem we face here is that there are a bunch of um, interoperability standards on the process level that are already around, but they are focusing uh, on technologies that are already about 10 years old. And we face today an educational technology and environment that is much more diverse than 10 or 15 years ago. So we have a lot of different technologies in classrooms and um, or even in online environments. And that is, uh, for example, smart boards in a lot of schools and uh, seminar rooms at universities. We have mobile devices in practically everybody's students' pockets. We have tablets everywhere. We have notebooks and so on and so forth. Uh, we have also an increasing number of specialized tools, services, and devices that are used for learning that are not interconnected and that make the learning that happens within these tools, services, and devices appear isolated. And it's hard to integrate them into an organized learning process that is managed by a virtual learning environment at a procedural level. And most interoperability standards, to come back to that point, uh, focus on integrated platforms and not so much on mesh-up environments. And again, emerging practices and advanced learning processes receive very little support by these specifications. So when we look at SCORM, which is the main driver behind the XAPI, was that it was designed for a world of ADL and e-learning that is like 10 years ago. It is mainly web-based, desktop-centered, and it's content-oriented. And if we look at the new approaches such as learning networks, simulations, personal learning environments, e-portfolios, mobile learning, adaptive open educational resources, tangibles, games, learning badges. This is all not supported by SCORM and it's very, very difficult to integrate them. And the XAPI should solve that. It should provide a very easy interface that allows uh, applications and services or even devices to integrate and interplay with a more resource-driven approach to learning. So it provides an interface that learning experiences that happen uh, with adaptive open educational resources, that happen in collaborative learning networks that are part of games or mobile experiences, uh, that they should be in, uh, could be integrated into one big environment that interoperates with a web-based training. So when we talk about the Experience API, we have to remind ourselves what we are looking at. So uh, the Experience API focuses on one part of virtual learning management systems. And uh, if we look at these learning management systems, it's pretty much like you open the hood of your car and you see the motor block within it. And you see a lot of parts which you can operate yourself such as the oil checker, but the Experience API is no such thing. It's somewhere hidden on the side. It's some, somewhat essential to your motor of your virtual learning environment, but it's nothing that you frequently will interoperate with or interact with, at least not 
consciously that keeps the thing pumping. So the basic autonomy of the specification has two parts. The first part is the experience streams and the second part is the learning record store. So the learning record store is something where the experience streams go in and be stored and can be retrieved at a later point in time. So first have a look at the experience streams and the statements within these experience streams. So basically an experience stream is a list of activities, a sorted list of activities that happen in time. So if you do something and you have something that monitors it, then you create an activity. If you do some, some more, for example, if you read a paper and then you read another paper, you have already two activities. And they accumulate into a stream that basically documents the activities of your learning process. And each of these activities can have several parts. And I list here the most essential parts that describe the learning activities. And uh, there are three core elements. The first one is the actor, which means who did the activity. And in most cases, if it's a personal activity screen, it's the learner, him or herself. Uh, you have verbs, which describe what the act actor did. And you have objects, uh, which were part of this activity. So basically, um, a statement could be very simply, uh, Christian read uh, a paper about the Experience API. Or what is, uh, has recently also happened, Christian presented uh, something about the Experience API. So the object would be the Experience API, the verb would be reading or presenting, and the actor is the name of the person. Uh, then you have a couple of additional aspects that uh, can also describe the activity. And this is the time when something has happened. Um, it's the result uh, of the activity. For example, if you take a test, it's also interesting what is the score that you reached in the test or what was the level of correctness of an answer or response that you gave to a question. You have an authority that basically indicates who is reporting about this activity, who has observed this activity and puts the, has put it into the stream. And then you have a very big thing that the Experience API calls context. And this is basically everything that is not part of these other elements, which could be the location of learning, which could be uh, other people who are involved in this learning, which could be um, additional resources that have been used or uh, the, the time that you spend using a resource and so on and so forth. So um, the act activity statement can be a rather complex thing that gives you a very good idea what happens, but it's itself very atomic or it can be very atomic if you want it. And in most cases right now it is. So these activity streams, they go into the learning record store. And the learning record store is basically nothing else than a storage for activity statements and streams. So the very basic thing would be that if your learning management system observes an activity, it directly writes the statement into the learning record store. But it could also wait, accumulate a bunch of statements and then send them in one big go. It allows also annotations uh, for subsystem integrations. So uh, a subsystem could add a state message uh, to an activity that helps it to recover a certain state uh, within the learning process, which means uh, something like, I have opened this or that uh, element in order to be visible to the learner. And uh, then the main functions for both of these things, the activity stream storage and the annotation system is basically store and query these activity statements. For this purpose, the learning record stores are specified as REST service, using a REST service API for external access. So we can have uh, different tools that integrate 
with a learning record store and interact with the learning record store using this API, which is a very simple way of exchanging data between computing machines. And on top of this API, the Experience uh, API specification defines that these services need to be secured using the OAuth, uh, OAuth security layer, which is another specification that deals with uh, learner identities and the rights of accessing personal information. So basically, the learning record store gives us a nice framework for storing statements and streams into it, having it persistent, and then be able to retrieve it for further processing. So the basic process uh, of the Experience API is that we have an activity provider that reports the, collects the experiences and reports the experience statements as an XAPI activity stream to the learning record store. And on the other end, we can have an activity consumer that takes an activity stream and reads it in order to do something. And this kind of basic process is also very common in other environments, which are called sensor networks. So let's have a look at the com um, commonalities between these uh, systems. So in sensor networks, you have as a as a, a reporting on the reporting side sensors you have some kind of store in the middle and then you have actuators so the sensors actually sends the learning activity and report it to some external system and then you have on the other end the actuators which actually make the virtual learning environment respond so uh, the actuator is responsible for which menu items you see uh, which visualizations are available, which uh, objects you can access in a learning environment. So this, uh, everything that is visible then and responded to the learner is part of the actuator. Everything that collects interaction, that records uh, responses and so on, this is part of the sensor. And everything goes through a learning record store in this sense. So what are uh, common sensors in virtual learning environments and the activities that are related to it. So we could have, for example, a wiki sensor that records all the updates that learners do to wiki pages in a, in a course. Or we can have a forum sensor that records posting on a forum. Or a resource sensor that checks uh, how many resources or, and which resources a learner has accessed. Or a test sensor. Or an assignment sensor where that records when a learner at what time uh, has submitted an assignment or several versions of that assignment. <clears throat> and we can have many more sensors, the more devices we can integrate. And if we look to the mobile world, we have a whole bunch of sensors that are already incorporated with the devices that we have, such as GPS, near field communication, uh, microphone sensors for noise levels, temperature sensors, screen interactions through touch screens, uh, light condition sensors through the camera, and uh, tactile sensors for recognizing shake or turn um, activities that the user deals with the device. So these sensors we can use and uh, make sense out of it within the context of the activity on the device and this these activities can then feed into the activity stream that is reported to the learning record store. On the other hand, we have the actuators. And these actuators could be message updates that are sent to peers. For example, when I post something to a forum that I get a, my peers get an SMS, uh, that there is a new very interesting article on the forum that everybody should read, uh, or an assignment is up. Uh, we can have portfolio updates that are automatically done if I pass a test or I finished an assignment. It can provide feedback, gives me information where I made mistakes or something like that. 
uh, it evaluates test scores, unlock resources, or provide new assignments and challenges to the learners. So this is, these are all actuators that can be based on sensor information that are coming in to a learning environment. So the Experience API, as you can see, is all about reporting and collecting learning experiences. So what do you need to do in order to bring this framework into practice? So the first thing that we need to remind ourselves that a learning record store is hardly ever standalone. And indeed, many learning environments and learning management systems, such as Moodle, Ilias, OLAD, and so on, uh, they already have variation of a learning record store built in in the user tracking. And most of these systems allow teachers to introspect these learning record store, but it's very difficult to make sense of it because it's basically the activity stream in its raw form. But it's already there. And you can see it on this little image where uh, we have the learning record store which does these activities. And um, as I said, this is almost always already a part of the learning environment. Well, this is not very exciting because this is already part of it. So, well, boring. Who's interested in that? Why do we need another specification? Well, let's answer it with our next question. How to build with various tools and services complex and attractive learning environments? So, the Experience API actually starts to make real sense and gets really exciting when we start connecting stuff. So i like to introduce the Mobler Cards app that we have developed over the past year, or one and a half years almost, uh, here at the ISN, which is basically a very small and very simple um, question-answer tool, very much like a flashcard learning system. And it's in itself not very exciting because it implements the microlearning approach that I have introduced about a decade ago. Um, but basic, and basically, this app gives you a question. It gives you a couple of answer opportunities that you need to answer. It gives you direct feedback if you were correct or incorrect giving this answer. And it can give you additional feedback um, that helps you to answer further questions or it helps you to answer the question correctly if you haven't did that in the first attempt. In addition to that, we have implemented a very small learning badges component that gives learners achievements when they simply put effort in the learning process. So we wanted to get, help them to engage with the learning process without really focusing on the success of the learning. And then we have, of course, because success is also important, we have a statistic section uh, that helps the learners to track their learning performance over time and see if they improve over the, uh, the time of learning. So basically, this is how the user interface looks like and the user experience is. Um, there are a few exciting things with this app because it uses a loose coupling with the learning environment, basically our learning environment here at the ISM, as well as a couple of our partner organizations uh, in Europe. But it is not a virtual learning environment plugin like many other mobile learning solutions of that kind. It's also not a standalone app that requires a lot of additional infrastructure around it to be actually able to run because it's fully integrated and connected to the web-based resources and courses that are part of the learning environment. And it directly talks to the virtual learning environment in which these courses are hosted. And it uses uh, the question resources that are part of the learning environment. And for that, it uses the IMS QTI specification, which is famous for testing and assessment. And we abuse it basically for practicing and helping people to prepare for such exams. And finally, it provides personalized learning support across multiple devices. So whereas other uh, solutions require somebody to download something on the device and then stay on the device and work there or work entirely web-based so you can flip devices, 
this solution can integrate both native application functionality with interoperability across devices. So if you do something on your iPhone, it happens also on your Android tablet if you want. And with this app, we implemented three XAPI scenarios. So this is where it comes into practice. So the first scenario are cascaded environments. The second scenario is the device synchronization. And the third one are mashup environment, which we just recently integrated into the app. So first, let's have a look at the cascaded environment. So we have our little app, we have our learning environment, which is based on the Elias platform. And potentially we could have any other form of an ePortfolio system. In order to provide offline support and direct uh, functionality availability across devices, we implemented interaction sensors that report to a learning record store that is directly integrated into our mobile app. So if we talk about learning record store, this doesn't need to be a huge big data cloud service interface. It can be also very small in our mobile apps. And this helps us to provide offline support and offline functionality whenever the user intends to use the app and not when the user actually has internet access. So this gives us a lot of freedom uh, to support learning experiences in locations even where the learner has no internet connection. And this learning record store then also reports and interacts with the learning record store of Elias. And we implemented a very small service for Elias that allows us to exchange data back and forth between our mobile app and the virtual lo uh, learning environment. The difference between the learning record store in our mobile app and the learning record store in the learning environment is basically that the learning environment is responsible for the course integration rather than for some kind of mobile app functionality. So it, this learning record store in the Ilya system helps us to inform teachers, for example, if a learner has reached an achievement, for example, or passed a certain threshold in the performance metrics, and so on and so forth. In the next step, then, there could be an ePortfolio system when, for example, a teacher says, hey, this is a very good thing, and a student should be able to report a certain achievement for a longer period of time outside of the level of the course. And in this case, the course the courseware or learning management LRS could interact with an ePortfolio LRS that then can decide if something should show up in a personal ePortfolio or not. The second scenario is the device synchronization. So this is what I said. We, we can have the app that allows us to do something on one device and it in, almost instantaneously happens on a different device using a different platform even. And what we basically do is we connect the learning record store from the LRS with the virtual learning environment from the different system, uh, mobile systems basically. And the virtual learning environment serves as a hub for the different activities that happen. In this context, we could even use uh, this setup for creating collaborative learning experiences. So other learners realize something has happened among my peers and I should do some more or do some less or wait for feedback and so on. So this is the device synchronization approach that we have dealt with that allows us to interoperate from different devices with the learning management system. The third one is actually more exciting. It takes this device synchronization approach even a step further. Um, we have recently implemented a way that allows the app to communicate with different learning management systems at the same time. And that basically means that I can have my iPhone and my Android tablet connected 
to two learning environments at the same time. For example, the PFP learning environment that we host here at the ISN and the learning environment of the Estonian Defense College uh, over there in Tallinn, uh, which uses also our, um, our application uh, for their purposes. And a mashup environment allows the user to follow courses and practice for these courses from two different institutions using one single app. And this basically works the very same way as the device synchronization. We send around activity streams to the different learning environments. Now the tricky part here is that that made our mobile app le um, learning record store more complex because suddenly we had to focus on which learning activities need to go into which learning environment which we had to do before because there was only one single environment that we could talk to at the time. So this also means that the mobile app learning record store has some additional features that we can use um, to differentiate where certain activities belong to and who should see these, these things uh, in their environment. So you see that uh, a learning record store is not just a storage where things can go into, it's also an administrative tool that helps us to distribute information to the right places. So now we have a lot of experiences collected in this app in our learning record store. So the final question I'd like to answer and to look at is how we use these learning experiences to make something useful with it. Again, we implemented three scenarios for our mobile accounts app. It's always three, it's nice to say. Um, the first scenario we implemented is the selection of test items. So the idea is that if a student answers a lot of questions over and over and over again, we want to present the questions that the learner is not so good at more often than the ones that a learner frequently answers correctly. So we implemented a very small function that uses dynamic dampening that favors the one, the questions and test items that were frequently answered incorrectly or not fully correctly and disfavors the answers that were frequently answered correctly. So if you use the app frequently, you will realize that certain answers would pop up more frequently particularly if you answer them incorrectly, than the ones that uh, you answer correctly. So it helps you to focus on the stuff that you cannot do already. The second scenario are the statistics perspectives. And this is a purely dynamic approach of analyzing the learning activity with a system based on a yardstick approach. So we set certain thresholds that learner needs to achieve and in our case the threshold is your previous day. So if you're better than the previous day it shows you a green arrow in whichever direction for certain parameters that tells you your performance goes up. If you see a red arrow you see that your performance went worse than before. So this allows the students to follow their learning practices and learning performances over time as they use the app. And they can do a couple of activities, go to the statistics and they change. It doesn't happen every only once in a day, it happens live on the data. And finally, the third scenario are the learning achievements or the learning badges. And this is dynamic until somebody has achieved a badge, which basically means that we show the learners, okay, in order to achieve the badge, you have to do uh, the, this or that many activities in order to get it. But once you achieved it, it's persistent. So it stays there and you got it and you can show it off every, to everybody. Uh, you want to uh, brag a little bit about your very exciting performance and experience that you had there. So how we implemented this. So here you see the, the basic logic, the learning analytics logic for the Experience API that we have implemented to achieve these three scenarios with a single system. So on the one end, at the lower uh, left-hand corner, 
you see the activity provider. These are our interaction sensors where the experiences go in into the LIS and then we have the storage in the middle. Based on that learning record store, we have a learning analytics engine that you can imagine that retrieves learning activity streams and analyzes these learning activity streams and sees how many answers does a learner have answered correctly, uh, what is the average score of answering questions, uh, or uh, is the threshold for learning badge achieved or not, and so on. And this learning activities and analytics engine can trigger certain events, and these events are directly related with the learning badges. So basically, when you reach a threshold for a learning badge, an event is triggered and sent to an event handler, which decides if this is a new badge event or not. And if it's a new badge event, it sends a new experience back into the learning, learning record store in order to make this experience persistent. So if we look on the actuator level around the dashed uh, square, uh, the dressed rectangle, we see that the statistics user interface makes direct use of the dynamic learning analytics engine in order to show the statistics to the learner. And there you see the performance, uh, <clears throat> the performance errors and the metrics that we display to the learner. Uh, the item selection uses also the dynamic uh, learning analytics engine using slightly different functions of it. And finally, the badges UI doesn't use directly the learning analytics engine. Rather than asking the learning record store, is an badge achieved or not? And then we show it persistently on the display if we want it. Otherwise, it works exactly the same as the statistics user interface. And finally, the last actuator is our Elias learning management system over there on the web, where we can send the activity stream uh, every now and then in order to inform the learning management system about the achievements of the learner. And as you can imagine, if we would implement this on a mobile device, as it says in the specification, this, this, um, the center three activities, this the loop of XAPI activity streams from the learning record store to the learning analytics engine to the event handler, could be quite excessive when it comes to a lot of information that is accumulated. So instead of implementing it explicitly as separate information, as separate services on our small mobile device, we have built an integrated component that doesn't use the high-level XAPI activity streams, rather than uses internal data structure, but triggers the XAPI statements to the external functions. So that helps us to save a lot of performance and a lot of power on the mobile device. So that makes our app, um, with that respect, less power consuming. So coming to the end, I'd like to summarize uh, the, the content of this presentation. So first, the XAPI is a new interoperability specification for connecting live tools and services. The XAPI also defines a REST service API and the activity stream data format. So <clears throat> it basically defines how to talk to a service that basically implements a learning record store and how should the data look like that we send to this kind of service. It also supports basic mashup technologies for device synchronization, cascading environments, and complex learning networks, as I just showed. And finally, I demonstrated that we need additional learning analytics on top of these learning record stores in order to influence richer learning experiences and steer learning processes in a complex learning environment. So with that, I'd like to conclude this presentation and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian, for this very interesting presentation. So now I'm going to the audio rights to the participants, microphone rights for participants, so that you can ask questions. Please go ahead. Do you have any questions? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so hello Christian, hello Natalie, hello everybody. Uh, thanks Christian for this uh, very interesting presentation about this standard that uh, uh, is a very new and um, looks very promising. Uh, I have two questions for you. First, I don't understand the comparison you did at the beginning between a SCORM and ThinkCap because uh, as far as I know, SCORM is a, a package, uh, a standard for packaging content, uh, uh, while ThinkCap is just a, a standard for interoperability. So, uh, to me, it's uh, much similar to IMS standards, uh, uh, and uh, I don't, don't probably uh, with respect to IMS standard, ThinkCap is. Um, uh, simple, uh, most, much more simple to use than uh, IMS, so uh, can invite people to use that uh, one instead of ILMS. But what uh, another question I have is uh, about the mashup of activities and the three uh, scenarios you presented at the end. Uh, the um, this learner record store that you presented to me is much uh, similar. To uh, what is a classical learner model. So in uh, uh, in these systems, uh, the learner model is a central repository of the learning activities. We have uh, done. We have seen a lot of uh, uh, people uh, working uh, on that, uh, doing a lot of uh, research uh, and prototype that uh, implement a, letter, a learner model. And uh, to me. Uh, uh, what is a learner record store is uh, exactly a, a learner model, and uh, what is the the, the 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 central problem that we have experienced in past research is not the standard, uh, the the the, um, the API, the integration between uh, the LMS and the the the, the app, the, but the problem is the integration of the, of the activities, the content. Uh, how do you create adaptive content? How can you adapt the test uh, with regards to the experience. In particular, this learning analytics that is the central point that you can create a real engaging adaptive experiences. Uh, this is the problem. Is, to me, the, the ThinkCap brings uh, um, a facilitation to the integration, but it doesn't help in uh, the what is uh, uh, most important from a didactical point of view is the, the engaging experience that you want to create. So that's my uh, my idea and my, my question to you. So first of all, thank you, Ricardo, for these two questions. I start with the first one. Makes sense. Uh, with regard to the differences between SCORM and the XAPI and how the two relate to each other, and indeed, uh, SCORM is mainly a content package informer. And what is not so much used as a part of SCORM is the sequencing component, which is a way to describe learning processes using the resources of a learning package. And it also makes it very difficult to integrate um, emerging processes, repeating processes that are going mm -hmm. on over the time. And um, that basically disallows integrating ex external services and uh, external devices to to interact with learning experiences um, with the with the resources that you have in a web-based environment. So this was the limitation that we saw. So basically, the SCORM package is a nice thing to have, and a lot of research had been done to look at okay, how can we improve SCORM? But basically, with regard to the sequencing, to the orchestration of the learning process, not with regard to the content packaging. And the sequencing is really where the X API hooks into. Yeah, so it's about arranging processes, uh, identifying processes, and making it easier to collect data from a learning processes and use data from a learning process that uh, are not explicitly defined by, by a process model, which is the case right now with SCORM, where you have to define 
everything explicitly. You cannot say, I throw in these five sensors and I may use only one of them, but at a later point, I can use the other four and uh, make something better out of it or uh, it starts to make sense once I'm further down in the course or so on. So the X API should loosen this up and at the same time, the X API should open the whole process, the whole sequencing towards external resources, towards social media, towards collaboration, towards mobility and games. So uh, the problem there was that SCORM is basically focusing on web-based training. But if you look at uh, the learning experiences that we have in in the defense sector, for example, but you can see that in management education as well and in many other sectors, uh, that there are simulators, games, uh, mobile inquiry, collaboration tools over and over the place. But it's very hard to define instructional designs that work on different platforms and to integrate experiences that are more emerging. And uh, this was the problem where the ADL initiative is started from and the XAPI is one step to it. And here we are exactly with your second question. What is the difference to a learner model from adaptive hypermedia and, and these approaches that are? And I have to agree with you, indeed, the learning record store is nothing else than a learner model. And indeed, the big challenge is not storing the data but um, analyzing the data and make something useful out of it. But what was the problem that we faced in, uh, in virtual learning environments or mobile tools that we had at this point? There are many different forms of learning, uh, learner models around. Basically, every single learning environment, every single game environment, every single uh, mobile app sports its own learner model. And it's very hard to integrate them and uh, make them act together. So basically what the XAPI does is it provides a formal, no, formal <coughs> sorry, a common notation for these learner models so they can be exchanged more easily between applications and services. Um, I also like to answer Samuel's uh, questions, question about uh, learner-centric environments and constructivist settings. So starting with constructivism, um, the XAPI has nothing to do with constructivism in itself. It's basically open and it focuses on um, the actual low-level activities that are happening and maybe higher-level activities that we can infer through statistics and, and other mechanism that we call so nicely learning analytics these days. And that goes into the learning record store. So the constructivist setting would be something that you have to implement at an actuator level. So basically, how can we, can we make um, learning resources or services play together and respond to what is in something like a learning record store. And this is a big challenge and we are about to answer these things and I like I intended to demonstrate one showcase based on the Mobler Cards app that we did on my second last slide actually. And um, this helps us to standardize also learner-centric and even collaborative environments where we can see what happens in different communities from different learners and can link them through statistical models and show to the learners and help steer the processes that then lead to better personalization and improving the constructivism or whatever uh, educational intention you have in a course. So I see a question from Per Bergamin. As we know, a lot of learning experience happens within individuals. It is therefore possible to look, uh, lock data uh, of the learning record store mm -hmm. questionnaires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what we cannot do 
is learning experience that happens within individuals. That's why I had to explicif explicify that when I talk about learning experience, this is something that we can see uh, that we can see happening as measurable results. And the LIS is indeed, or and the X API as such is indeed designed to link data from different learning record store and to make something useful out of it. And this would be something that I illustrated in the mesh environment. Of course, we implemented a rather simple setup in our demonstrator, but you could easily imagine more complex mesh networks uh, involving e-portfolios, mobile apps, simulators, and so on. So the idea is really uh, that we can link the different experiences in different environments and make a more complex uh, and more appealing learning environment for the learners. And finally, I see the question, how should annotations in the LIS be used as attributes? Yes, annotations are, are something obscure in the learning record score. Yeah, they are something like additional attributions that should are useful for the um, for the sensors. So a sensor can send an activity and say, okay, with this activity, I like to store an internal state that I may want to retrieve at a later point for this specific learner. And this is how they should be used. It's nothing that you uh, may want to use for uh, linking the activity streams in a bigger network and by mesh, well, mesh up environment, sorry. Yeah, querying is therefore highly important. And this is what the REST API provides us. It provides us a simple interface to query certain kinds of activities within a learning record store. So I can filter already out by requesting certain activities uh, what I have in my activity stream, which I then will analyze. Uh, uh, the question of Yona is how to link social media and I consider social media as something that is a commercial external system like Facebook or a different system. And right now, there is no real solution for it. Um, we have the specification available. We have a very few demonstrators where we can show how the technology works. And right now, we are looking at socializing uh, the X API approach so we can have an interface that allows us to hook um, this kind of system into something like Facebook or um, the blogosphere or something like that. Um, but we are at the very beginning with this regard. So the first step that we had to take is to re-identify what are the concepts that work in a complex environment and then look at the several different technical details that arise from specific commercial products that are around. I hope this answers Iona's question. Um, yes, well, you have to implement somehow the interface. It's a bit like OAuth at the beginning. There were a few players like Google or Twitter who used OAuth at the beginning, and then more and more people came on board. And this is the situation that we are currently in. So it's not, as I said, I talk about prototypes and data formats, and it won't work in Moodle, for example, right now. But I know that, for example, the Moodle community is currently working on a learning record store interface implementing the Experience API for their system. Or what we did for Ilias was implementing uh, the, the parts that we needed for our app as a plugin to Ilias. So we're, we are starting to get the thing done and uh, the integration on demand is something that is indeed right now happening, but we're looking forward that over next year or two that we have more systems that can natively play together. Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Maybe we have time for one last question. So Petra has written in the chat, what is the difference between X API and Graph API? 
I mean the Facebook Graph API. Yeah, uh, the X API is something that is open and is part of a community process uh, in, for providing interoperability between systems of different providers. The Graph API is something that belongs to Facebook. And it's not really clear if Facebook actually wants to claim license fees or something out of it at a later point. So probably it's, it's similar to the uh, Graph API. I haven't looked into detail into that because we cannot use Facebook whatsoever. Um, but the X API seems to be very similar to what I have read on the, on the abstract level. And it's somewhat served the same purpose, but in a more diff distributed setup. Rather than being locked into Facebook, you're more open with the learning environments that you are intending to use. Okay, thank you very much, Christian, for this really very interesting presentation. And also thanks for the participants for all your interesting inputs and questions. So um, I'm going to stop the recording now and I say bye-bye to everybody. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.